Hello. Oh, yeah. OK. Uh, thank you, Al. Um, it's great to be back, although I'm in a different building. Uh, but it still feels like coming back, obviously. Um, so I'm going to be talking about working with Bulb, the energy company. Has anyone, anyone heard of Bulb here? Oh, wow, most people. Uh, who, who uses Bulb? About half. Cool. So I'm going to give the other people my referral link. <laughs> <laughs> 50 quid a pop, so, you know, it's good money. Um, is anyone here from Bulb who works at Bulb? No. That's good. <laughs> because, <laughs> no, it's, it's going to it's, it's be very kind, so it's okay. Um, so, first off, um, so th how this came about was that uh, sometime towards the end of last year, I decided I wanted to kind of branch out and find new people to work with and to work for um, as a freelancer. Um, partly because I discovered that uh, I find it quite difficult to work with uh, certain types of organisations who I guess are only interested in accessibility from a standpoint that maybe they would get sued or get into trouble otherwise and so they just sort of go for it like they're going through the motions and that kind of thing and so I did this thing where I just put up this little hire me page and said uh, basically just sort of wore my heart on my sleeve and said this is the sort of person I am there's all the sort of signifiers there saying like I'm a bleeding liberal and a lefty and everything um, do you want to work with me and I got contacted by a few people which was nice and one of the people who contacted me was uh, Alec Armatova, who uh, is the head of design at Bulb, and we talked about maybe having an engagement there. So Bulb, uh, in brief, they are a green energy company. They do like 100% um, green electric, and then uh, about as much green as you can do with uh, gas. Um, it's a really kind of simple offering that they do. They, they offer one tariff for everyone, so it's, it makes, that makes signing up easy and also means that everyone gets the same deal, so there's a lot of equality going on there. One of the things I really like about Bulb is that it's a really, uh, they're a diverse team of people, um, uh, international team, um, uh, very gender diverse as well, and neurodiverse. Um, I mean, I guess that's probably what it's like working in London anyway, isn't it? I mean, I'm from Norwich, so <laughs> it's not quite as diverse in Norwich as it is in London, but hey. Um, uh, one of the cool things actually is that they have a really unusually high number of women in senior positions, and senior positions in in, uh, in engineering as well, which is quite unusual and really good. Um, but they identified and they were worried that their interface wasn't especially accessible, partly because as a startup, um, uh, they had to put things together quite quickly, and that's just one of those things which falls by the wayside, which often happens, as you know. But they really wanted to fix it. So one of the first things they did after we talked was ask me if it was okay to put out a blog post saying, basically, Hayden's going to come in here and he's going to fix everything. So hence the picture of me. I have shaved, actually, since I had my terrible beard, but uh, sweating it out a bit there. But I thought this was a really good idea, though, actually, because a lot of organizations will do accessibility work kind of not in the open and then sort of show you the bits that they got right <laughs> rather than actually uh, saying, hey, we're going to make everything as accessible as possible and actually making themselves accountable. So they were prepared to to make themselves accountable, which was really good. And they'd done that with other things as well. They hadn't just done it with accessibility. They'd also done it about the uh, recruitment process and all sorts. Um, so uh, who's heard of, heard of an accessibility audit? OK, great. So this is a sort of an industry thing that's well known. So I cut my teeth doing accessibility audits with the Pass Yellow Group, um, who um, are really focused on providing really prosaic and really in-depth uh, audits which don't just point out where the problems are and why you know what WCAG thing they relate to or whatever they actually expl we actually try to explain in depth like why it's important who it affects and and why it makes a difference and that kind of thing so I've sort of took that learning process from working with the Pass Yellow group and I uh, to do this audit for the uh, for bulb and I actually used uh, a system that I developed with the Passiella group called Cupper, and it's sort of like a static site generator, but for 
generating documentation, but that documentation can be used as an audit report as well. The idea with Kappa is that the end product is actually really accessible, so anyone can can actually uh, read and use it. Um, but also, it has lots of little short codes. It uses something called Hugo, um, which allows you to do short codes, which you might be familiar with with WordPress. But this is like short codes in. Uh, Markdown, and you can write your own. And I wrote a few which helped me to kind of do references and, and talk about accessibility stuff easily. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. And so what I did is I organized these issues into component issues and to general issues. So component issues um, is a thing that I focus on more and more because people are more and more interested in building things in terms of design systems. And so the idea is that developers actually work on components. So they're not going to be thinking in terms of, I'm going to fix color contrast across the whole application, or I'm going to go and do all the alt text in all of the different websites that the organization has. That's not how you work, right? So by organizing things in terms of component, we take that one component and say, there's a color contrast issue with this. There's some alt text which isn't right. Um, this keyboard accessibility issue here because it's an invisible element that receives focus or whatever. So you focus all of those issues around the, uh, I guess, the the primitive of the design system. But there's also general issues as well. So there were things that there seemed to be a lack of understanding or lack of care in terms of things like um, heading structure and nesting headings and, and sections of the document correctly. And you can't really reduce that down to a component. So hence, there's those issues there. So that's how it's kind of organized. Um, one of the things that Kappa lets you do is it. Uh, um, I programmed a sh uh, quite a complex shortcode which allows you to basically put a working component using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in line with the documentation. So you can talk about how this component should be built and then actually make a demo uh, and put it in there. And uh, for instance, in the uh, for Bulb they, on their marketing site, they had one of these sort of like a basic. Um, collapsible section thing. And so I just remade it using uh, a heading and a button and uh, ARIA uh, uh, expanded state and made it accessible in a sort of technical way. And I could demo that to them. And the launch, little launch thing there is just so you can, you can push it out into its own window. And then you've got a, like a reduced test case, so you can run automated testing over it, make sure it's accessible. Um, but that was kind of like uh, felt like a neat way to to demonstrate things to them. And that's kind of how it works there. That's just like your short code tags either side of the of the what is essentially the guts of a web component inside it. So this kind of relates to what I think I've found has been quite an important skill and a very difficult one for me to learn because I'm I come from a first of all a art background but then went into HTML and CSS uh, because that were they were kind of to me design tools was learning JavaScript and that's taken me a very long time to learn JavaScript um, but what has turned out to be quite a uh, I think a useful skill as someone who consults um, in terms of accessibility is learning vanilla plain JavaScript because then I can solve the reduced down problem and then the organization can turn it into whatever kind of flavor of JavaScript they like, if you see what I mean. So I give them like the raw kind of focus management -y stuff or whatever it is in JavaScript. And then they, in fact, Bulb had three websites when I started. One was in React, one was in Angular, and one was in <coughs> Squarespace. So, um, <laughs> so uh, the Squarespace one is React now, so it's, <laughs> it's fine. But, um, but I mean, organizations will, will, will make something in React and then maybe change that to Vue or something as well. And I think having um, documentation in plain JavaScript means it's applicable to any of those cases. So that was the idea behind it anyway. Now, there's a sort of dramatic irony element to this talk in that I discovered fairly early on, whilst I was doing the audit, a tremendous bug which, as it turns out, people had noticed, but they, they didn't know how to fix at the time until I came and discussed it with them. It's this enormous bug. Uh, and the customer service people, big up to the customer service people in Bob, because they, they got complaints from people sometimes. Well, not complaints, I suppose, like um, uh, uh, emphatic feedback um, about the interface and, and then not being able to use it the way that they would expect or, or that they would have liked. And um, w the development teams would receive this, and then we'd try and act upon it as best we could. And this, this one piece of feedback, um, just to... Um, just to talk about the highlighted bit of text here, they were a voiceover user, and 
they were trying to use the account system. So that was one of the properties, which, which is managed in React, a single page application. And they could not use it at all um, because everything seemed to just be text, like, and it was all read out as, as one block. There was no structure. There didn't appear to be any lists or headings or anything like that. Um, I'm not going to tell you what that bug was yet. I'm going to tell you at the end. But I will tell you that it involved a single attribute, an ARIA attribute, uh, which blew everything up. So look forward <laughs> to that later on. Um, so after the, doing the audit, uh, sometimes it just ends with the audit, and then you kind of hope that the organization will go away and fix things. Uh, and sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't, or sometimes they don't even read the report. Um, but Bob were really genuinely interested in engaging me and getting me to actually work with them to try and fix some of this stuff. So I was working alongside both the designers and the developers. And um, so <laughs> now, so the problem with this drawing, right, is that I forgot that Norwich was north of London. So when I first did it, Norwich was down there and London was up there, and, and hence that. So now that I've fixed it, I'm flying my helicopter backwards to London. And uh, so <laughs> the cool thing about having a helicopter is that it's, it's automatically monogrammed if your name is Hayden. So that's, that's kind of nice. The helipads, it's like, oh, that's my helipad. But uh, I don't like flying, so that's why I'm sad in the picture. It's not because I'm going to London. I like London and Bulb. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I, I, would, I would work remotely sometimes, and we do remote work, but also I would, I would come to the office so that we could actually have face-to-face -face meetings as well. And they, I know that in the modern age that working remotely does work, and I think that um, companies don't support it enough, but it was really valuable to be in the office and to actually chat with people face-to-face uh, -face as well. So now, Bulb, so I, I guess to start with, I got to know the organization. And one of the things that I learned was that they were divided into what was called pods and guilds. Now, I don't know if this is terminology which is common. Have you heard this sort of terminology? This is, I guess this is just a bulb thing. OK, so the pods were, they were the small teams responsible for the certain products. So one pod would be uh, in charge of the account system, one would be the marketing website, and one was the, like, the join path, which is a separate website where you um, uh, which is how you sign up or how you switch from your previous energy provider. So they're the pods, and then the guilds are they're kind of um, organised around your skill set. So broadly speaking, there were developers, and there are um, energy specialists. So they were the people who were on the phones; they knew everything about energy, and they would talk to people. And there are designers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and what that meant, what was nice about that, is how that intersected and meant that actually the pods were really um, interdisciplinary. Um, I think this, I think GDS are good at this as well, from my understanding. But having small teams, where you have like a, you have like a classical programmer, you have an interaction designer, you have a content writer, you have a researcher, and they all work closely together, and that worked really well. So how I fit in though was not. Uh, this was a sort of an open question to begin with. Um, and as we sort of felt things out, the way that it seemed to work reasonably well was that, well, they would create visual designs um, and imagining how things would work. So they weren't set in stone. They weren't like high def spec things. Uh, they they did have the branding and everything, but they were they weren't precious about them, which I think is important. Um, then I would annotate those in terms of accessibility, um, and this is kind of uh, this is something that um, I guess I, I first heard about from Henny Swan, who uh, used to work with the BBC, now is with Pass Yellow Group, annotating those visual designs and saying, here where you see this visual artifact, that needs to be this kind of heading, and here uh, where you're using this form, there needs to be this kind of error messaging and that kind of stuff, and just putting the technical detail in there seemed to work kind of well. And they use something called Figma. Do, does anyone use Figma? One person <laughs> uses Figma. Um, I don't know how accessible Figma is actually as an interface, but it worked for us. Basically, you'd have all these speech bubbles around this thing. And then actually, without asking, um, one of the developers uh, took some of these requirements, essentially, that I put in here and just put them into JIRA and essentially said, refer to this Figma and, uh, and when you're coding this, and just read the notes when you come to making these bits. And that would ultimately be turned into React components and stuff. So the accessibility stuff kind of got, um, got looped in that way. 
But uh, ultimately, we were building this design system. And we would be building a design system because Allah, who's in the middle there, who, who is one of the leading lights in terms of design systems, uh, was leading this project. And there's me on the right. And that's, the, that's kind of everyone who worked on the design system at, at Bowl. That's us on the balcony. Um, Alice read this, uh, written this book called "Read This Book." She's written this book. I'm assuming she read it uh, as well, but um, as she went, perhaps um, brilliant book, uh, which is available with Smashing Magazine. She's she's a stable mate because uh, my my books with the same people kind of thing. But I, I do really recommend the book. It's great. Um, and by the time I joined. Uh, They'd already covered quite a lot of things, and they'd done it in, in, a, in a sensible way. They'd actually thought about inclusion. So the colors were all chosen so that you didn't have contrast issues, um, and the iconography was as clear as possible, and the microcopy was written to be in, you know, as clear as it should be, and that kind of thing. So if you, um, what I forgot to mention is that that audit I did, they made public. There's a link at the end, so you can explore the actual audit that I originally gave them. Of course, it will be, it's talking about stuff which we've mostly fixed now, but, um, but what's not covered in that audit is contrast and color contrast and things to do with the visual design so much because they'd actually been proactive and, and got a lot of that stuff done already. And so the idea is with any kind of design system, what you want, of course, is that you have a set of components, hopefully accessible components, and they can be propagated across all of the different uh, properties, in this case, these three here. And uh, the one we worked on to start with was the marketing one. And it turned out this would be in React, which is better than Squarespace. I don't know what Squarespace is actually written in, but they had loads of trouble with Squarespace. There were things to do with accessibility, which you just can't do because it's not designed that way. Like You can't change the title elements, um, value across different pages and things like that. So you have the same title. And of course, that, that's going to be confusing if you're a screen reader user going between pages. And in any case, we moved to React. And actually, marketing, if you're interested, that, that site was built in Gatsby. So there was a there was kind of performance boon to it as well. It wasn't a single page application for static content, because that's kind of a silly thing to do from a performance perspective. Gatsby is it's like a static site generator, but built in React. Um, so this is sort of this is a bit sort of lateral, but one of the things that I discovered early on. Um, because Alec came to me and said she felt it was a problem, was that every, everyone at Bulb is a full stack developer, which meant that no one had a particular specialism in CSS or HTML. They knew their JavaScript really well. In fact, they had a huge amount of knowledge in terms of sort of classical programming. But there was no, there was no one who was kind of in charge of HTML and CSS, that kind of thing. And because I'm, I'm from a background of being a front end developer, very quickly after we began our engagement, I sort of went from being the person who makes things accessible to the person who actually does front-end stuff. So I did some, uh, not entirely me, of course, but um, some of the things that I did early on with the design system was not addressing accessibility directly, but to make um, really easy to use and really reusable basic generic components so that it meant that building things out was quicker. And the idea was that um, that would buy us time to actually focus more on accessibility. Um, so the idea was that we'd have these sort of pre-made little pieces and then we can kind of build the thing out. So we weren't like focusing on bolts and we weren't focusing on whole like buttresses, but we were focusing on these little bits. So for instance, uh, we created this thing called vSpace. And what that does is when you wrap that component around different elements, which in React terms would just be the, uh, the generic uh, children uh, available through props, it will inject margin between those elements, but not um, above or below it. And the margin would be set uh, uh, using our design system's uh, uh, modular scale. Uh, it's based on the lobotomized owl selector, which, uh, has anyone heard of that? Yeah, OK. So I wrote an article about it a while ago. But it just made things easier to lay things out. Because before that, we were sort of doing it in a really piecemeal way, like adding margin props to every single element. So that was to speed things up. And similarly, we did like I did a really generic responsive grid, which is based on this grid system I wrote a while back called Fuck All, uh, which is a, a grid that fits in a tweet, uh, a grid system that fits in a tweet. So it's just Flexbox, and it just automatically wraps and expands everything, basically. 
Um, and while we were working on this stuff, there was a sort of an intersectional element to it as well, because they're broadly interested in bulb in, in the ethics of the way that they make things. So they wanted it to be more accessible, but simultaneously, they wanted uh, to cover other bases in terms of ethics. And one of the things that I suggested was to support Do Not Track, um, which is a protocol which allows users to switch off all of the pointless and the various tracking things, Facebook segment, all of that stuff. Um, which might be running, and you know, they, the marketing like that sort of stuff because it optimizes things and tells them where people are coming from, and they can work on that or whatever. But giving people the opportunity to not be tracked is great. And in JavaScript, it's quite simple. You just here's where your tracking scripts would go, and if they have do not track uh, set the user, I mean, you have to go into your browser and actually check a box to make that so. But but then we wouldn't track them. Uh, so this sort of it doesn't address disability so much, but it sort of relates to the, the broader ethical side of things. So we brought that in as part of the remit as well. Now, user research was really interesting um, because they they were really really good at user research. Their design system. So you can see their design system at design.bulb.co.uk, and it has lots of research insights actually kind of in between bits of the documentation. It says, and the reason we did it like this was because of this direct insight we had from some research with some real uh, users and real people who helped us uh, helped us go through and, and check things. And uh, so they have their own lab on site. Uh, which is all kind of kitted out really nicely. But the other thing that they do, which is really handy, and this, this happens over and over again, of course not everyone can actually make it to the venue, to the office, in order to do user testing in person, especially if they have a, dis a physical disability. So it's set up, and with permission, we could just do remote recording. So people could sit at home and use their own computer and drink their own tea, and we can talk them through the interface and, and test it out. And we got some really interesting insights. Um, one of the things which kind of surprised me, but I guess I should have known, um, uh, regarding, because I think we're all quite optimistic about some of the stuff which we technically solve in terms of accessibility. Well, I've got the area in all the right places, um, therefore it's accessible, but actually there's every chance that the user doesn't understand what it is or how it works, and it's just surprising to them because it's unconventional and quite new, because area and implementing ARIA well is uh, relatively new to everyone. And one of the things we found was difficult was um, with live regions. Do I need uh, the live regions? Does everyone, who knows what a live region is? OK, so about half. So a live region is where you have an element and um, you put a role of status or a role of alert on it. Or you can use the ARIA live attribute instead. They're kind of equivalent. and. By putting content into that element, into that container element, it automatically triggers the readout in screen readers. So just by injecting it with JavaScript, injecting the node into that uh, container, um, a screen reader user will hear uh, what's going on. So the advantage and the idea there is that um, you're able to message to two assistive technologies, two screen readers, without actually having to move the user somewhere or, or ask them to go somewhere to find that information. So theoretically, it's really handy. Unfortunately, we've been doing, we've been using uh, other methods to do that kind of thing for so long, and usually by um, programmatically moving focus between things, that users think that's what's happened. So in the case of this, um, map here. Now, so this is a map um, which allows you to explore the different generators that Bulb has around the country. And it's written semantically, so the, these map pins are actually a list, and they contain buttons, and the buttons have labels uh, which are accessible, um, you know, uh, visually hidden labels. So all of that stuff is technically correct. So what we did was the idea was that when you clicked on a button, after focusing it, and you can see the focus outline there. We, we chose a nice pink focus outline. I, I fought quite hard for a pink focus outline. Um, the, the, uh, this is actually a live region. The reason being, we weren't confident that the user would know to select that map pin and then find their way to that content and then find their way back through. So by making it a live region, the idea is that you just click the button and then just hear the information. The problem was that they didn't expect that to happen. They expected, or when they heard new content being read, they assumed that their focus had been moved anyway. So we kind of had to be more explicit with our labeling and say click to hear more info rather than just name the uh, 
name the actual generator. So we kind of went at halfway house there. But um, it was an interesting insight. Another one, so this is a good example of where uh, your own kind of prejudices or your own uh, way that you like to use interfaces kind of uh, impacts on the way that you interpret things. I'm really utilitarian, so if I was going to sign up to an energy service, um, then I want it to be as much about just that process and about what they can offer me as possible. I'd want it to be really pared down and really simple. For the marketing site, and Bulb generally is like that in terms of their communications, really direct uh, about stuff. But for the marketing site, um, it felt as if we weren't doing that enough in terms of, there was kind of a lot of uh, branding, I suppose. And it involved a lot of photography. Do you know what, I'm actually gonna, oh, that's better, <laughs> right. So um, yeah, so we had a lot of this photography and things like that. And to begin with, um, I felt as if this kind of, these sort of brand flourishes, if you like, were probably not that important to, uh, someone using assistive technology. They probably want to just get to the salient information. But then we did some testing and, and uh, we had someone in who was a screen reader user but partially sighted. And that's, some, that's someone, unfortunately, who's easy to forget about because we tend to think of screen reader users as being uh, blind people. Um, and one thing that we found was that uh, they, because they could partially see the photo, they really wanted it described, so they wanted to know more about it. So we were much more, um, we, we became much more descriptive with our alternative text. We tried to be evocative as well in the, in the phrasing. So here it says, a bulb energy specialist turns smiling to the camera in a naturally lit and bustling office. Actually, I wrote that and actually it makes me feel sick now that I read it back. But, um, but uh, it's better than being sort of too on the nose, if you sort of mean, if the idea is it's supposed to give you a sort of a, an atmosphere, I guess. So we reinstated a lot of the alt text. We treated fewer images as decorative for those reasons. And that was a, that was a real sort of insight, I guess, for, uh, for the team. Um, one thing though, and this is where I guess I had to sort of draw on my experience and knowledge of conventions, the same, uh, one of the people who, who were uh, in testing actually brought up the problem of there not being alt text for some of this imagery also was really interested in our logo and how it was made and the way it looked. And so then the team's response was, oh, let's describe the logo in great detail. And this is the logo at the top of the page, which is in a link, which is just the homepage link. So I know from convention that really, because it's a link, first of all, but also because it's, uh, um, it's a homepage link, you really ought to be uh, just giving it a functional alt text. It should be telling you what the link does. So instead of doing the word bulb written in curly cursive lettering, you know, I mean, this is, I guess this is what I, you, you take insights from, from doing research, but you don't just do what the user tells you, because in this case, it was just someone who was really interested in branding and typography, which is not, um, which is kind of unusual, I suppose. So you don't do that because that's not helpful in this case. You would, it would say link because there's the role and then you'd have bulb homepage. So I kind of, I said well, in this case, trust me, you know, we, we're going to do it in the functional way. Um, <coughs> so obviously uh, from the outset, people were really interested in measuring things, especially like higher ups in these organizations. They want to be able to say it's going to be 100% accessible. And of course I said, of course it would be lovely if it was, but nothing ever has been. And uh, it's a very difficult thing to measure anyway because our diagnostic tools, like our automated testing things, disagree with each other. They miss things which um, we've actually done to improve the UX for, say, for instance, ex assistive technology users or colorblind users. And they, they don't, then there's not things they can even pick up anyway. So I kind of had to be really clear that we were gonna make things a lot better, but we would have to treat any kind of diagnostic tools uh, responses with a pinch of salt. Um, so yeah, we had to we had to be careful about that kind of thing. We we use just as a and it is helpful to use it as a kind of a um, just to see how far you're getting um, and how close you are to it being you know considered good. Um, we used Lighthouse just as a just as a, uh, a kind of a litmus test thing. And uh, it has false positives. It's a, it's a good tool, but it has false positives. There was an iframe on the page we were looking at, and 
it was complaining there was no title because, of course, you need to uh, label iframes and the title attribute is how you do that. Um, but it was set to display none, so it wouldn't have been available to assistive technologies anyway. So I knew that was okay, but it was difficult to explain to people then, therefore, Lighthouse is only giving us 97% rather than 99 or 100% accessibility. It was kind of a difficult one to explain to kind of explain, but actually we could have just removed the fucking iframe, but there you go. Um, I think that was actually there to be injected with a tracking script, so, uh, you know, that's the way it goes. But, um, yeah, so we measured as we went along, but I, but, uh, I made it very clear whenever we were presenting about it or whenever we were doing kind of recaps that actually we've done a lot more that isn't represented with these tools and everything. Um, nothing that I covered whilst I was there was quality assurance. So. Uh, in regards to the design system, we, we would start out with, um, obviously we build the components and then they have to be approved one way or another. We have a sort of uh, review process on GitHub, you know, you, you send pull requests and they get reviewed and whatnot, the usual way that people work. Um, but I also wanted the QA team, there was a couple of really talented QA people there to um, to bring accessibility in the way that, into the way that they judge these components. So it wouldn't just be about visual regressions in terms of the, the visual design or just about uh, its compatibility or any other errors or anything like that. I really wanted them to test, manually test, uh, or use automated tools as well, but to manually test this stuff. Um, so I actually wrote them some scripts. Uh, so there was one which basically just went through steps for keyboard and it was kind of like try this out if you tab around and you don't see focus styles that's a fail that kind of thing so to actually manually test things um, and the screen reader and zoom as well so sit down with a device which is touch screen can you pinch zoom um, if you zoom in to 200% um, is stuff coming off the edge of the screen do you have to horizontally scroll you know it should be responsive all of that kind of stuff and all of those scripts are actually written out and it's on their design system page under accessibility. There's some other resources there as well, but that's that's all written out. If you want to, you can borrow and have a look at those scripts if you want. Um, yeah. Uh, and on top of that, in a sort of related way, but before I left them to um, uh, take care of accessibility on their own, <laughs> I had to kind of also do like a an intensive training up. Um, they'd learned a lot just by us working alongside each other, of course, and they developed their enthusiasm for it too. But um, we did some workshops where um, basically I would go through a testing process with them and we looked at some deliberately awful websites like uh, Ling's Cars and things like that. That's always a really good one to show people because it's absolutely full of terrible stuff. There's actually some really good thoughtful accessibility stuff on that site as well, but it's a mixed bag, to say the least. But we'd go through that and I'd say, you know, I would do this first, I would I would turn CSS off and look at the structure and then I would look for these things and then I'd use this tool to pick out alt text and this tool to look at the document structure and the heading and nesting, just to walk them through it. Um, but we also talked about design process as well, because that's, I think, to me as a lot, as a designer, I guess, is a much more important thing, like making things accessible from the outset. So from the testing point of view, we would use some tools. So this one here, revenge.css, is one I wrote a while ago. So revenge.css uses CSS selectors to produce visual regressions with pseudo content to deliberately damage the visual design wherever there's an accessibility error. Are you following me? So if you've got an accessibility error in the page, the CSS will use pseudo content to put some Comic Sans uh, text in there, which has got the error message. It's quite fun when you use it on the Twitter's web API. You get a lot of pink Comic Sans boxes. Uh, so we use a number of tools like that. There's another one called, um, which you might have heard of, called HTML Code Sniffer. And as it turned out, there were two there were two people at Bulb who'd previously been at the organization who developed it. So they're like, yeah, we know that tool. So they were happy using that. And then um, to teach them how to go through using a screen reader, um, I developed this um, drum machine using the web API a while back. And I just stepped through using that with a screen reader because it's got so much stuff in terms of uh, controls and things. You've got sort of expandable controls and, and area pressed going on up there and you've got uh, check boxes and group labels and, and sliders and stuff. So that's a good way of like showing them how to, uh, how to test with a screen reader because there's a lot there to get stuck into and then we can start making drum beats and messing about as well. 
Um, but the ideation part, the kind of design process part, was uh, I felt the integral part to this because we were building these components and uh, it's not enough to kind of build a component and then make it accessible, that never works. There are only certain types of component, only certain actual designs for component, even before you touch the code, that are likely to be accessible because they, they, they're not going to be, um, uh, they're going to be too complex and too unconventional to work in a screen reader in terms of just the user being able to understand how they actually are, are put together and what's expected of them in terms of using them. So uh, we did a whole session where we were just kind of like, this is a problem we have to solve, and then uh, what's the best way to solve it? What's the most likely to be accessible to the most people? What's the simplest and the most direct way to do it? So it's all you know, post-it notes and all that classic stuff. Um, and sort of dovetailed into that, I so very shortly before I left, um, someone said, well, now you're leaving. We've got some outstanding issues. I want you to try and rate them. And I kind of immediately put my heckles up and I thought, oh no, I haven't really explained this very clearly. Now, it was a slight misunderstanding from the point of view that what they meant was what are the priorities in terms of the accessibility issues. But what I had to make clear is that accessibility is a civil rights issue. So everything had to be top priority uh, in terms of like you're either doing it properly or not. I guess. So that, that had to be kind of a strong message as I left. And they understood that and they're embracing that, which is really cool. Right, so the bug, the uh, the really, really bad bug. Does anyone got a guess, by the way, as to what the attribute? <laughs> There's a few. A uh, really good guess because application can mess things up because a role application will take the user out of virtual cursor mode and, and removes all of the keyboard shortcuts that are familiar. No, although that would also screw things up because it would read the whole page out like on page load, right, and that sort of stuff. Presentation. No, <laughs> although that's really good too. It's actually, it's a, it's a sad story, <laughs> but one that we've overcome now. So it's, uh, there was a router um, in React uh, because it's a single page application. This is on the account site. And uh, it has this switch component. And of course, this isn't semantic HTML, this is a React component, so this is a div, really. Um, but someone had put role equals switch on there, and you can sort of understand why. They were thinking, we'll make it accessible so it says switch, because I think some people understand, I think that's how ARIA works, is that it's like putting a name in there or a string, and it will just simply say the string when you come to that element. So it was with really good intentions that they were doing that, but effectively what it did is it told, it turned the whole application into one giant button. So all of the content, all of the content, at least in assistive technologies, all of the content was just, just became the label. So it had all of its sort of structure removed from it. Um, so, uh, as you'd imagine, that completely broke everything. So there were good intentions there, and actually, I don't know if it was someone at Bulb or it was actually the plugin author or some third party that put that role on there. But I know that what they were trying to do um, was the right thing. And so, you know, when people are trying to make things accessible, even if they've got it wrong, it's important not to be harsh and to go, right, you're on the right path, you're trying to do the right thing, but that's just not how ARIA works. Um, so there was simply a knowledge gap. But it also says something about how powerful ARIA is, and I don't know, probably in my experience, I've seen ARIA break accessibility more than I have it improve accessibility. Um, and this obviously was the case for that. But it was a really good opportunity because I was due to leave and I wasn't going to be working with them anymore. There was obviously still outstanding stuff. We hadn't got quite as much done as we'd liked. We were proud of what we did, but you know, as these things go, we didn't make it 100% accessible. Um, there were still things that had to be done, things which were being held back because um, that's one of the things with having a design system is that as important as it is to have that system in place, when you invest in that design system, getting your existing products to integrate with it is going to be, you know, in a backwards compatible way is going to take some time. So there were things which we just couldn't fix, there were blockers in terms of the design system, that kind of thing. So all I wanted before I left was to make sure that the the development team were excited about accessibility and doing and and had an ongoing enthusiasm for it. 
And this bug was a really good example. So what I did is I scheduled a meeting with one of the developers, one of the people I thought was already quite uh, conscientious and, uh, I mean, they all are in different ways, but this person had shown some interest already in accessibility. And I said, I'm, we're going to fix a bug now and it's not going to take very long. It's one attribute, but it will make the application 100% more accessible for at least one person and probably very many more. And they were like, okay, yeah, right, sort of thing. And so we did, we went, we went in there and together, because I kind of needed to learn the, the workflow uh, in this pod, in this, in this team uh, as well. So we did it together. And um, once we'd fixed it, I, being a bit naughty, uh, because I knew that uh, it wouldn't break anything, um, I just skipped the review process and just pushed it to master. Um, I was very politely told off for this, but I, I'm not employed by Bob, so they can't fire me, so it's all... <laughs> That's all right. Um, but I'm glad I did, because this is the message that we got back. Remember there was that person who, that specific person who complained about it. They said, well, wow, this is awesome customer service, I must say, for a disabled customer. I've never experienced something like this where I uh, file up an issue to do with accessibility and ownership is taken and a fix is put in so quickly, literally in days. Well done to you and your colleagues. This is to the customer service person, not to me. I've looked at the web pages using Safari on my iPhone with VoiceOver. Everything seems to work. This is absolutely spot on and fantastic from my point of view. So we were really chuffed, obviously, to hear that, especially since the absolute sort of, um, uh, I don't know, just they're just really, really pleased. And it, it, it sort of, for me, went beyond just, oh, we've done a good job and we can boast that we've, we've fixed this thing. It actually seemed to give this person a bit more faith that, that there are companies who are interested in actually fixing this stuff and actually do care about uh, people with disabilities. Um, it's one of many bugs. There was a lot more, obviously, to fix. But the coolest thing about it was then back in Slack, I was talking to this developer and I, I had promised them that we were going to fix this thing and it was going to, it was going to actually really help someone. And they were genuinely then excited. That's them saying, yes, I'm very excited now. I was kind of excited about accessibility before, but I think it's triggered something. So they were, they were going to have an ongoing engagement with it and want to do more now. And they've now um, made accessibility like their key um, OKR now after doing this. So that was kind of cool. Um, so before I finish, uh, because I think I'm just about to run out of time, just a small note on the full stack thing, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so Bulb now have decided to, to hire one or, one or more front-end developers. And I didn't, want it to, uh, I didn't want it to come across that I was dissing <laughs> full-stack developers. If you can do all of that stuff, then you're more talented than I am. The problem is that when we give, when we kind of think of coding as if you can do this kind of code, then you can also do this kind of code. Like coding itself is a skill, then we get into problems. That's where things go wrong. And, and accessibility tends to be one of those things which is affected quite badly. Because if you're worrying about APIs and database query optimizations and things like that, that accessibility is only going to be a small one of your responsibilities. Um, so I think it's important that we think we, we think of, uh, in terms of code as a tool, which lots of people use in different ways and solve different problems. So I will solve problems with CSS that can't be solved by a computer science PhD, uh, you know, um, but I can't do what they do. So I think it's important that we, we, we don't think of code as just, we don't just make certain people code gatekeepers. They do all the code or whatever. Um, that's just a little rant that I thought I'd tie to the end there. Um, uh, and just finally, uh, this idea about inclusive design, which I think is really important. So obviously, like I said, everyone, the, the pressure was we need to make it accessible, 100% accessible. We need to make this thing go from being inaccessible to accessible, like it's an on-off switch and it just doesn't work like that. And inclusive design, you don't go from incomplete to complete. You're always trying to make it better. Uh, but it's important to, just because it's not a Boolean thing doesn't mean you're failing. Just because you're not getting, you know, uh, a green thing in a test doesn't mean you're failing. If you're going from bad to better and you're getting good feedback, then you're doing really well, is the idea. Um, so the resources, the order is available there um, on the uh, GitHub, um, on, Bulb's, uh, on Bulb's GitHub account. So you can have a look at that, dig into kind of the stuff that I've reported to them. Design system is there, design.bulb.co.uk. The switch role, if you want to read more about that, is it, it's kind of a button-related role, but uses area checked. It's 
kind of pointless. Um, and oh yeah, there's revenge.css if you want to have a go at that. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Um, so we do have um, a, a little bit of time for a few questions, but Hayden is also going to be around in the breaking stuff. So yeah. um, hands up if you've got a question. Where was I there? Hi, Hayden. Um, Hi. I'm interested to know what you did in your workshops. I'm running one in a couple of weeks, so need some ideas. <laughs> OK, cool. So. Um, like I said, I, I, I like to focus on the design process part of it. So most of the workshop was that. Uh, with Bulb, and I kind of tailored it to them, uh, I, I do do a sort of a, a workshop um, anyway. Um, but they wanted specific things. And, and so I went through the whole process of testing, first of all. And, and the way that I just test, because it always has to be a combination of manual testing and automated testing. So I, I showed them the tools, and but also the kind of things that I was looking for and that sort of stuff. But then the second half of the workshop, and it was like it was like a half-day workshop, was actually um, the ideation thing. So we actually would just sit down and talk about how we would solve a specific problem. In this case, the problem was, um, <clears throat> say, people wanted to submit reviews for, for Bulb service. Now, this is a hypothetical. They, they weren't working on that necessarily. Um, but uh, how would people review um, review the service they were getting or the or the uh, the energy quality that they were getting? And so we talked about different ways that you could you could write write that in text. You could have like a star rating. You could um, do like a medium type thing where you do like hand claps. Um, uh, and so we, we came up with all these ideas, got rid of all the ones that we thought probably would be too difficult to, were too sort of unconventional or too difficult to make accessible or easy to use. And then were they actually using Create React app because they're, they're essentially a React place now? Um, they coded them up. And then um, we, I got the teams to, they were in teams of two, I got the teams to, to switch. So you'd have one ambassador for their their version of the interface, and then someone from another team would come along and test it using the uh, methods that I talked about in the first half of the workshop. So that's the basic structure, and that's how I did it with Bulb, anyway. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. All right. Hello. Um, I was just wondering if you've got any advice about getting developers bought into accessibility. Uh, good question. Um, so to get them interested and to get them motivated, sort of. Yeah, so I work for a company called Capital Capital One, and they're big on making their website accessible. Mm. They work with R and IB and stuff like that. But I've had not issues, but talking to other developers in Capital One on different um, systems, mm. they don't they either don't know about it or they're interested, but they don't. Um, they don't develop in an accessible way. I just wondered how to maybe inspire them, or I don't know. Yeah, it, it's, it's one of the the most difficult things is to get um, if the culture isn't there. Because it was, I guess, it was easy enough at Bulb because I knew that they already, and it's the reason that I kind of did that shout out because I was looking for people who already had the motivation to do this stuff. Um, but it's still, I mean, it was still uh, in some ways an uphill struggle to to get people to actually focus energy on it because because they had so much else on because that full stack thing again there was like there was 10 or 12 responsibilities for that week and accessibility any you know is any one of them um, what I would recommend is to put a roll switch on on something get them to fix it get a customer to come in <laughs> yeah I mean we were really lucky with that it, it was really hard I don't have all the answers there and it ultimately ultimately it comes down to uh, people either care about it or not, and if you can show them somehow how it makes a difference, uh, I mean, I only had that one example, and it's difficult to come by, obviously as well. And it was kind of a fluke, 
but um, if you can kind of show them how it makes a difference. Also, uh, another one that's um, uh, my friend Adrian Roselli. He has a he has a good way of doing it, which is he shows people. He he does a talk called Selfish Accessibility, and that might be a good one to look up and show them actually, where he he talks about how he likes to make things accessible because it makes his life easier as well. So it's not just about addressing the uh, people with uh, disabilities who you've not met. I mean, you should care about that anyway. But um, but he was. He, he uses an example of um, keyboard accessibility, where he's saying um, uh, if you've got a motor impairment of some form, like I mean, I have uh, lots of uh, lots of people in my family who've had Parkinson's, so they have trouble um, using a mouse and and that kind of accuracy. Obviously, you're going to want to use a keyboard, um, but also he uses the example of if it's lunchtime and you're eating a sandwich with one hand, you know, with the hand that would be using the mouse, then you probably want to use a tab key rather than, you know. Uh, and that's that's another way in maybe is to show them how actually an accessible interface is just a more ergonomic and easier to use and more flexible interface generally, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, so I think that's all time for questions at the moment. We're going to have a break. If we have space at the end, are you staying till the very end? Mm. So if we have space at the end, we'll have more questions then. Um, but we should give all a, a break, and um, we all need drinks. Um, so yeah, if you want to go next door or drinks. Um, Hopefully James will be here um, and we'll kick off again at about quarter past eight. So yeah, about 20 minutes. Thank you. Um, and a massive thank you to Hayden for a fantastic talk. And yeah.